And let's stand together, page 115, continuing to look at the love of God for us this morning. Let's sing together as we stand, Love Lifted Me, page 115. I was sinking deep in sin, blood from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me now safe and We'll sing that third verse in just a moment, but I have several announcements before we are uh, singing that third verse. Junior Church, you're dismissed a little bit early this morning, so Junior Church, you can be dismissed. As the choir comes down, shake hands, say hi to one another, greet one another now that you can see their faces, and we'll sing that third verse in just a moment. Well, let's sing that last verse together. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus, he does completely save. Let's sing that last verse on the third. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Would you please come forward? We'll take this morning's tithes and offerings. And while they're coming, uh, be in prayer for both Teresa Jones and Teresa Dilling. Both of them are in uh, at Ball Memorial uh, this weekend. And so pray for them as they're both recovering. Uh, that God would be with them and their families. All right. Well, Mike, would you mind praying for us? Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. Well, a few announcements to make you aware of. Reminder that tonight is going to be our church business meeting, and so we're going to be kind of looking at uh, our staffing going forward, and so we're going to be looking at making my dad pastor emeritus, and so we'll vote on that, and uh, time for any discussion or questions, and then we're also going to be looking at making myself uh, the head pastor, and so be in prayer for that, and uh, tonight will be a good night. Deacons, we will meet at 5.30. Uh, before the service and uh, just to make sure we're ready and pray together and so that'll be this evening all right and then september 16th our all the senior saints are invited over to our house we're going to have a luncheon and we're going to meet out at our house at 11 or if you'd rather just ride the bus uh, we'll meet here at 10 30 and take you out and uh, that'll be a good time if you want to sign up for a side or dessert there's a sheet on the back table and you're welcome to do that okay and then the deacon's wives are throwing an appreciation dinner and housewarming shower for my mom this week, and, uh, or not this week, but September 22nd. And so that will be at 6 o'clock out at the Barn 38 venue. And so uh, if you would like to participate in the housewarming, uh, they are registered at Walmart, and you can just sign up on the back table uh, to help them know head count and prepare for food, okay? Uh, and then this week is the big week. We have Harvest Rally. Tomorrow's the work day. Sam's going to uh, come and tell us about that. Uh, but a few notes for us and our service times. Reminder that this coming Wednesday, we will not have midweek service. We will actually have Thursday night service down at the farm at 6.30. And uh, so uh, make a note of that. And then Jeremy Frazier will be here with us next week for a combined service at 1030, okay? So uh, don't show up at 10 or you'll be all by yourself. Show up at 1030 and uh, have a good service. There are two things we could use a little help with before I turn it over to Sam. Uh, Jeremy Frazier's team is going to come. He has a music team that travels with him and we could use a little bit of help accommodating them for next week. We are looking for a place for some of his team members to stay from Friday uh, to the following Friday and they'll just be there in the evening but they need a place to sleep at night and so if that may be a possibility we have a group of girls and then one guy and so if you could help with that let us know and then also we're going to be providing lunches for them here at the church on Monday through Thursday and Monday and Tuesday are covered but we could still use a little help on Thursday or on Wednesday and Thursday and uh, if you can help with that see Karis okay well I'm going to turn it over to Sam and I'll let him get us geared up for this week and Sam why don't you come and just share what you have all right, so Brian's already given you a few of the announcements, which is good. Uh, so I'll just give you some of the times. Uh, tomorrow is the work day. We'll start down at the farm at 9 o'clock in the morning. Lunch is provided. You guys have heard me do this for four weeks now, I think. So you could probably each come up here and do it. So here you go. Uh, I'll let somebody else do them. Um, if you're worried about the weather, uh, don't be. Whether it rains or not, that's what God wants for the weather this week. Uh, so we're just going to adapt. Uh, and we'll, we'll make do with what God gives us for the weather. Uh, if it rains, it rains. We're still planning on putting tents up as long as there's no lightning. Um, I mean, you can still, you know, stand there and hold on to the center pole if you want if there's lightning. Um, 
I'll probably make my way up to the tool shed. Um, but uh, that's the plan. It looks like, uh, you know, we all, we all know how the weather forecast is. Um, it looks like we've got a window in the morning uh, to where we'll be able to have some time to put the tent up. Generally, we can get that up by lunchtime. So as long as we'd have a few hours, about three hours in the morning, um, you know, we should be able to get that done hopefully by lunch. Uh, and if the Lord would be willing to hold the rain off uh, till 3 or 4 o'clock, that'd be great. But if he has it rain at 10 o'clock, we will we'll figure it out. So I guess I'm saying all that to say just be flexible with us because whatever happens, happens. And we're going we're gonna to make some decisions on the fly as we go. So uh, it seems like that's where I live. So it won't be anything new for me, but it may be for you. So. Uh, and then Brian already mentioned about the Thursday night service. That's at 630. Uh, and then next Saturday uh, is the big day. We ask if you're coming out as a worker, uh, be there at 730 in the morning. Uh, we'll have donuts and, and things for you as you get there that morning uh, to help get you, hopefully, get you energized and get you going. They'll have some coffee and orange juice and donuts. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for you that morning. We do ask um, if for those of you who were there last year, we gave away for the 40th rally, we gave everyone that was there uh, a green harvest shirt. We would like for all of our workers, uh, that's kind of a trend we want to have going forward for our workers to wear those green shirts that day. That way you kind of stand out and we can let the teams know, hey, if, if you need help uh, with something, you know, go find someone uh, in the green shirt that, that you're official now. So uh, if you don't want to be official, I guess don't wear your green shirt, but we do ask that you would please uh, wear your green shirt. If you weren't there last year, uh, or maybe you've worn your short shirt a bunch this year and you tore it or whatever, um, we will be, our, our plan is from Harvest Teen Rally to you is coming as a worker, we'll be giving those shirts away. So if you wore it out, we'll give you another one, but if you didn't, please wear the one that we gave you last year. We don't have an abundance of them, but we do want the workers to uh, please wear those green harvest shirts uh, on Saturday. And then several of the signups that are back there, uh, most of you have signed up and taken care of those things. There's uh, the sign-up list for the yard kids, the barn kids, uh, those that can help uh, work, help Gina out with the uh, kids in the yard. Uh, concession sign-up looked like it was all filled out, so the only announcement there would be Try and get those things here. If you can, get them here tonight. That way you're efficient with your time and you don't have to make another trip back to the church. Uh, or I guess you could always bring them direct down to the farm if you're coming Thursday night. But the preference would be that you would bring them here. Uh-oh. Don't bring them down there Thursday night. I'm getting a look. Um, bring them here tonight. All right? Okay, I did good. Man. Is it hot in here? <laughs> bring your items here that way they can go they'll go through this week and they'll kind of check through everything because uh, they go shopping uh, this week and get everything else that they need so bring those things here don't bring them down there Thursday okay all right then if you can't be there on Saturday uh, we've got a few slots left on the prayer chain sign up uh, just sign up on that if you can't be there uh, but you still want to be a part of the day uh, and then one the last announcement I have, if you can at all help with us uh, that morning, I know several of you have in the past, uh, with the parking and the greeting first thing that morning. Uh, we'll meet real quick, um, probably in this front classroom up here. We'll meet real quick right after the service this morning. I uh, just want to go over a few things because that's a first thing in the morning uh, job on Saturday. So if you can at all help with that, um, you know, meet there. We'll go over a few things this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, any of you that can, that can come and want to help with that, um, just meet there real quick and we'll go over a few things. And looking forward to seeing what the Lord will do this week. Uh, we're excited for it. I hope you are too and we'll be prayed up and ready to go. Yeah. Amen. Looking forward to that this week and just excited for what God's going to do. We've all heard the phrase that actions speak louder than words. You heard that phrase before in Romans 5, 8 says that God commendeth or showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm so thankful that God doesn't just tell us that he loves us, but he has showed his love towards us. He has shown action towards us. Let's stand together. Page 103. Oh, how he loves you and me. He doesn't just say that he loves you and me. He has shown. 
that he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how much he loves me. Let's sing that together. Page 103. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. singing this morning. You may be seated. Don't forget all he's done. Don't forget victories won. Don't forget in the race he gave strength for the run. Don't forget Jesus' care. Don't forget answered prayer. Don't forget, don't forget, you saw his hand everywhere. your Lord God Jehovah remember how much you were changed by his word forget not the days he taught you to praise though hard seemed the way of the Lord remember for that he took you when he gave you a hunger to abide oh don't turn him away he bids you to stay right where you belong at his side How the time has flown by and the memories have died. I've forgotten the joy when in him I abide. How I long for the day when his strength was my stay. Lord, forgive. Lord, renew. Lord, revive me today. Remember your Lord God, Jehovah. Remember how much you were changed by his word. Forget not the days he taught you to praise, though hard seemed the way of the Lord. Remember how far that he took you when he gave you a hunger to abide. Oh, don't turn him away. He bids you to stay. Though gone be your song, 
the weak or the strong, stay where you belong at his side. Amen. Acts chapter 20, if you would, Acts chapter 20, and appreciate our music folk being flexible this morning. For a while, it looked like we weren't going to have electricity for our service, and so they had to rearrange some music, and I appreciate them uh, doing that, and our Sunday school teachers, and I appreciate you working with us, and glad it came back on for the service this morning. Well, Acts chapter 20 is where we're going to be this morning, and uh, I was tempted not to preach out of this passage. There's a, a series we're going to start next time we're together uh, that I'm excited about. We're calling it Made for More, and uh, I was tempted to start that today, uh, but decided against it, and you'll see why here in a minute. But Acts chapter 20 and verse 25, if you would, with me. And this is Paul speaking to a group of pastors. In verse 25, he says this to the pastors in Ephesus. He says, And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll look at this text this morning. Lord, I thank you for how good of a God you are to us. And uh, just to look back on how faithful you've been and how, how trustworthy you are, we praise you for that. And Lord, I pray as we enter into a, uh, a new season today as, as a church, that you would just give us your hand, that you would go with us, that you would be uh, as gracious going forward as you have been in the past. So we thank you for all of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How many of you have been coming to Grace Baptist Church for two years or less? Anybody out there? You've been coming for two years or less. You're the, the new kids on the block. You're still getting it figured out, okay? How many of you have been coming to Grace Baptist Church for five years or less? Okay, even a few more, all right? Uh, how many of you would say, I've been coming to Grace Baptist Church for 10 years or less? Anybody here? Uh, quite a few of us, all right? Now, let me, let me flip that on the other side. How many of you have been coming to Grace Baptist Church for 20 years or more? Do we have anybody like that? Wow, that's faithfulness. That's amazing. Now, let me ask you this last question. How many of you have been coming to Grace Baptist Church for 37 years or more. Wow, quite a few of you. Now those that have their hands up, this will not be true of them, but any of us that had our hands down and have been coming to Grace Baptist Church for 37 years or less, today we are going to do something that we have never done as a church before, and that is we are going to be looking to nominate and vote in a new senior pastor. Now that's a, that's a long time, 37 years. The, the last time we looked at that was 1985. How many of you were even alive in 1985? <laughs> I looked up a few facts about 1985. If, if maybe you'll remember this. They say Ronald Reagan, he was serving his second term as president in 1985. A guy by the name of Michael Jordan was the NBA Rookie of the Year in 1985. There was a company called Blockbuster that was founded in 1985. You made it longer than Blockbuster. That's pretty good. That's impressive. They say in 1985, a pound of bacon was $1.89. They say a gallon of gas was $1.20. That sounds like a good time. And I found this little tidbit. They said that in 1985, you could buy a six-pack of VHS tapes for $2.99. If you don't know what that is, ask your parents after the service, <laughs> and they'll tell you what it is. All that to say, it's been a long time since we've had to look at a new senior pastor, and, and there's no other way to look at that except to say that's a blessing from the Lord. Amen. That, that faithfulness, that... That brings glory to the Lord on several fronts, the faithfulness of a, a man and a, a pastor, faithfulness of a church and the unity, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing. We thank the Lord for that. But tonight we're going to look at a new head pastor. And 
I just want us this morning to make sure our hearts are prepared for that. And I want to make sure that we, we come into this and, and we joke around and have a good time, but the truth is, we need God's wisdom in this area. We, we cannot enter into this lightly, whether on the, the church's part or on the staff's part. We, we need to seek God's face before we make this type of decision. It's his church, it's his decision, and we need to make sure we're doing what he wants us to do, amen? amen. And uh, Acts chapter 20, the reason I chose this passage is because this passage gives us some direction on how a church should handle this type of situation. I'm thankful that we can find God's will in God's word. Amen. Amen. You, you don't just have to go through your life and guess what the right decision is. You can look at God's word and the principles and the commands. They guide us in what the right decisions are in our lives. And the word of God has a lot to say about the relationship between a pastor and the church. And you look throughout scripture, you can... You can see a lot that scripture says about it, a lot God has to say about his church and how he wants it run and, and what that relationship is supposed to look like. But, but I chose Acts 20, verse 28, because it kind of summarizes what all of scripture talks about when it comes to the area of a pastor. Uh, in our kitchen, Kara, she, she's a good baker, and uh, she's got this thing called vanilla extract. And what that is, it's a, it's a concentrate. And it takes this, this little, small, little bottle, and, and it packs it really uh, powerfully in a small dose of this concentrate of that flavor. And that's kind of what Acts 20, 28 is. It takes the principles of what a pastor is supposed to be for his church, and it kind of condenses it down into one simple verse. That's what I'd like to look at tonight, or this morning. We uh, look at Acts chapter 20, and here's kind of the background. Paul is the author of this passage, and and he is traveling and trying to get to Jerusalem by the time that Pentecost happens. And so he's kind of at a rapid pace. He, he's trying to get there in time. And, and what he wants to do is on the way, he wants to meet up with the pastors from the city of Ephesus. And so he sends a message ahead and he has these pastors meet him in a small little town about 30 miles uh, south of Ephesus. And, and there he tells them that, hey, this is probably going to be the last time I ever see you guys. He loved this church. He loved these people. He had the pastor at Ephesus for three years. Uh, many of these pastors were probably men that had been saved under his ministry, probably discipled under his ministry, and, and this is the last time he's going to get to talk to them. And so he gives them this charge in verse 28, this, this challenge. He says, as a pastor, this is what it needs to look like as you serve the Lord in this role. He says, first of all, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. I, I simply, as we get our hearts and minds ready for tonight, I, I want to look at five characteristics that a pastor needs to be to his church. And uh, I, I preach this maybe more so to myself than to you. But if we're going to see if this is what God wants us to do, we need to do it God's way. The first characteristic I see of a pastor is, number one, a pastor has to have godly character. A pastor has to have godly character. Look at the first phrase. He says, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. The word take heed has the idea of pay attention to, self-examine yourself. Make sure that you are the man God has called you to be. You look through the New Testament, especially 1 Timothy 3, and, and God lays out what the character of a pastor needs to be. He doesn't say a pastor needs to be perfect, but he says a pastor needs to be qualified. A pastor needs to have the, the characteristics of someone who is seeking after God. You may have heard about the three pastors that on a Monday morning they got up early and they, they met down at the lake and they hopped in this little boat and they, they go out and it's just as quiet as can be, no one around. And, and the three pastors start talking and, and uh, one of them says, guys, I, I, I can't tell anybody else this. Everybody thinks I'm perfect, but but I, I've just got some stuff in my life that, that I, I need to tell somebody. He said, he said, I'll tell you guys my biggest sin that I hide if you guys will tell me your biggest sin that you hide. And they said, okay, we'll do that. And so the first pastor out there on the boat, he said, he said well, no one knows this, but I have a problem with the bottle. He said, he said I've got it stashed in my drawer and my desk, and, and every, every Sunday after the service, I go to the bottle. 
And the guy says, well, that's not good. That's not good. The second pastor says, well, well, I got, I got a problem, too. He said, he said I'm, a, uh, I'm a gambler. He said, people don't know it, but I go to the next town over, and I'm a, uh, I got a major gambling problem. I'm in with the wrong type of guys, and it's just not good. And uh, the third guy, he just sat there quietly. And they, they said, well, what's your problem? He said, I'm not going to tell. They said, no, we told you ours. We got to hear what yours is. What, what's, the, what's your struggle? And finally, after a few minutes, he looked at him, and he said, well, my problem is gossip, and I cannot wait to get out of here <laughs> and tell everybody what I just heard. <laughs> you know, a pastor, God doesn't call a pastor to be perfect. He's a, a man like any other man, but the, the overarching theme of his life needs to be that he is God with character. It tells us in, in 1 Timothy 3 that someone who's a pastor needs to be blameless. In other words, the the, the, any accusations wouldn't stick to him. He has that type of reputation. He needs to be a husband of one wife. He needs to be vigilant. He needs to be sober. He needs to have good behavior. He's given to hospitality. He's apt to teach. He's not given to wine, not a striker. He's not greedy for filthy lucre. He's patient. He's not covetous. He rules his house well. He's not a novice, and he has a good reputation among the unsaved. God says before you can be a man that leads God's people, you need to be a godly man. And the first characteristic of a pastor needs to be, number one, he has to have godly character. But not only that, we see not only does a pastor need to have godly character, a pastor needs to have godly compassion. He goes on, he says, take therefore heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. A, a pastor needs to be someone that takes heed to his flock. He cares for the people of his church. He gives them their attention. And, and I, I like what Paul felt compelled to put in there. He said, love all the flock. Did you pick up on that? And uh, I can't help but when we think about this, don't you think Paul probably had a few church members in mind when he said, love all the church? Don't, wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, would you agree there are some people that can just be hard to love, aren't there? Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker that says, uh, uh, the more I'm around people, the more I like my dog. Anybody seen that, that, that bumper sticker before? And what Paul says is this. He says, you need to take heed. You need to care for. You need to give attention to all the flock. You need to love your people. I'll, uh, I'll say this. I, I grew up in, under his roof. I, I got to serve under his ministry for a decade here. And I'll tell you this. I have never seen a pastor that has loved his people more than my dad has. Amen. I just haven't seen it. I, I can tell you, uh, countless nights we would be at the house and he would get a phone call in the evening after supper and somebody needed counseling or encouragement. He would just spend hours on the phone trying to help and encourage that person or that couple. He, he would get calls late at night and someone had gone to the hospital and, and without a second thought, he would hop up and he would go down there because he wanted to be with them. He wanted to be beside them. He loved his people. We... Uh, we, we always joked about it. it. seemed like every time we would go on a family vacation that someone in the church would die. And uh, our, uh, our running joke was, it's a good thing we didn't take more vacations so there wouldn't be any of you guys left, you know. <laughs> and we would, we would have a family vacation planned and, and uh, seriously, someone would pass away or, or something else serious and, and dad would come to us and he'd say, hey, listen, guys. Hey, we're going to reschedule it. We're, we're still going to do it. And he never neglected his family, but he would always say, they, they need us right now, and we're going to be there for them. And he was a pastor that had compassion and loved his people. I remember when I first came back here on staff, July of uh, 2012, and I was talking to Dad about uh, one, of my, one of my fears was, would I be able to come back to the church I had grown up in and be able to be effective in ministry. You know, people see you grow up and do dumb things your whole life. It's, it can be a challenge to, to come back and lead, you know. And uh, he said, he, he told me this story. He said, he said, when I came back to be youth pastor here at this church in 1985, he said, I had the exact same struggle. He had grown up in this church. He uh, had gotten saved as a teenager, uh, had, had rode on the bus in the bus ministry, eventually became a bus captain. Uh, in fact, mom was one of his, uh, dad was her bus captain, and I think that's why he liked the ministry so much. <laughs> and 
And he had grown up in this church and gone off to Bible college, and he was asked to come back and serve here. And, and he said, I was having the exact same thoughts you were having. He said, I, I went to an older pastor that I respected, and I told him my concerns. And the, and the older pastor said, well, those are legitimate concerns. But he said, one thing that will be going for you is this. He said, with that church being your home church and that being your family and the people you love, he said, no one will love that church the way you'll love that church. Now, I think we've seen that the last 37, 40 years. And, and he's a pastor that had compassion for his church. Uh, can I tell one more story? Am I boring you? There, I, I heard a guy, I heard a guy, one of our men, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to him. And he told me a story about dad, and, and this just summarizes him as a pastor. He said, he said when he was younger, him and his wife, uh, they, they, as a younger couple, were struggling a little bit, getting off their feet financially. And uh, there was a week where they didn't have everything they were needing, even for groceries. And somehow dad had heard about this, and so he, he called the guy down to the church and, and asked him to meet in his office, and they sit in the office, and and across from each other there, and, and they start the small talk, and, and Dad looks at the guy and says, he says, how's everything going? And uh, the guy said, I lied. <laughs> he said I, I said, I said, I'm doing fine. And Dad said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And Dad said, well, I heard you may be needing a little help with this or that, and, and yeah, yeah, I guess so. And, and, and Dad, you know, gave him some help so he can get groceries. And as they were leaving... I guess what my dad said to this guy was this. He looked him dead in the eyes and said, if I ever hear that you are in need of something and do not come to me when I can help you, he said, I do not want to be your pastor. I, I tell you what, he said, he said that, that line was said, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, and he said, I still remember it. Because that, that's the type of thing that shows a pastor, he's not doing it for a paycheck, he's not doing it for, for the clout, he's doing it because he loves people. And a pastor, he needs to be someone of godly character, but he also needs to be someone of godly compassion. Take heed to all the flock of God. A pastor, third of all, he has to have a God-given calling. Look down at verse 28 again. He says, over which, get this, the Holy Ghost hath made you the overseer. Do you get what he's saying here? He's saying, guys, let me remind you, the reason you are pastors at this church in Ephesus is, is not because it's something your parents wanted you to do. It's not something you do because you, you think it'd be fun or you like talking in front of people. The reason you are a pastor is because it is a God-given calling. And the office of a pastor is something that, that God does it's God's church. He is the one that, that, that calls pastors to the church. And, and I just want to remind us tonight, as we come to this decision, we need to make sure that what we are going to do is God's plan and not our plan. Amen? It needs to be a God calling. Uh, a couple of months ago at the, the deacons meeting, Dad let the deacons know that he was about to retire. And for the first time, we kind of discussed the possibility of maybe myself candidating to become head pastor. And uh, they asked me, what would your thoughts be about that? And I said, uh, the same thing I've told you before. I said, you know, we love this church and uh, it's family to us. And if we can serve in that way uh, and it'd be helpful for the church, we'd be honored to. But, but I also said this. I said, guys, I also want to make sure you do not feel obligated to candidate us for that position. If you feel obligated because we're already on staff or the pastor's son, he's, uh, I wanted to make sure they knew that, that, that there would be no hard feelings if they decided not to because I do not want this to be something that we do. I don't want this to be something that we feel obligated to do. I only want to do this if this is what God wants us to do. Amen? And uh, if this is not what God has for us, then I don't want to do this to this church, and I don't want to do that to my family. This is something we can only do if we feel the Lord is calling us to do it. And so I, I'll tip my hand and, and tip where I'm heading to at the end of the message, and that's this. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you would take some time this afternoon to seek God's face. Take some time and, and seek the Lord on behalf of our church that he would give us wisdom and unity and power going forward. If this is what he wants us to do, make it clear. 
A pastor has to have a God-given calling. Then fourth of all, a a pastor has a God-given commission. He says, uh, he says, over the over the which the Holy Ghost has made you, here it is, overseers to feed the church of God. There are some things that a pastor is called to do by God, and we can summarize them nice and neat this way. He is to lead, and he is to feed. He says you are to be the overseer, and you are to feed the flock of God. You are to be someone that, that leads the church. The word pastor literally means shepherd. I haven't dealt with them much, but I've heard you cannot drive sheep. If you try to get behind a flock of sheep and push them, it will be very hard on the sheep, and it will also be very ineffective. Uh, What I've heard is the way that you lead sheep is you love them, and you get to the point they trust you enough that when you lead, they'll follow. And that's how God has called the pastor to lead the church. Not as lords over them, not pushing them, not not as a dictator, but someone who loves them and they willingly follow. We, uh, Dad's been on staff almost 40 years. Stan was on for 35, something like that. And, uh, you know, between the two of them, we had about 700 years of experience here at this church. (laughs) And uh, last last April, all that kind of changed in a heartbeat. We went from a very experienced staff to a very inexperienced staff of one. And uh, I remember during that time, I would be making decisions and having conversations and meetings. And and, uh, afterwards, I would just be saying, oh, I hope I didn't just break the church (laughs) with that. And uh, I felt like I was making all of these mistakes and all that sort of thing. And and, uh, Pastor Holman, he took me out to lunch. And I kind of told him this. I said, I said, my prayer is I'm, I'm, I'm not ruining the church. And uh, he gave me a great piece of encouragement. He said this. He said, he said Brian, he said, you're going to make some mistakes. He said, people will be patient with mistakes of your head if they know that you can tr- they can trust your heart. They'll, they'll be patient that you make the wrong call on, on this program or that program or who you should have talked to first in order, and, and they'll be patient with you with, with issues of the head, but but make sure they can trust your heart, that you don't run over people, you don't betray people, you, you make sure they know that you love them, and they'll, they'll work with you. A pastor, he is to lead, and a pastor, he is to feed. He says there to feed the flock. Part of what he's talking about here, it's, it's broader than just preaching, he's talking about the care of the church as a whole, but, but no doubt part of what he's talking about is preaching the word of God. A pastor's responsibility is to guard the doctrine of Scripture and to make sure that what the church is being fed is substantive and true to the Word of God. I was over at uh, the hospital with Teresa Jones yesterday and uh, just talking to her, and and, uh, we were there for I don't know how long. And and one of the things she asked, she said, well, how's that new baby doing? And talking about Isaac, he's four months old now. And I said, I said, he's good, he's good. I said, uh, he's just in this loud phase. Like, he just screams, and he's loud all the time. And she looks at me, and she goes, oh, sweetie, you've got another preacher in the family. And I, I said, that was uncalled for. <laughs> Part of the role of a preacher is to guard the doctrine of the church. And not to give his opinions, not to, to, to go with the latest trend and self-help books and, and entertaining stories. The, the job of a preacher of the Word of God is to do just that. It is to preach the Word of God. He is to lead and he is to feed. And then finally, let me give you this last one. I know we're about out of time. But the fifth characteristic of a pastor is a pastor has to be God-conscious. Look at the end. He, he's talking about the church that they're leading, and then he, he very intentionally puts this phrase, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He reminds these pastors that the church does not belong to them. The church belongs to God. Amen. It is his possession. He purchased it with his blood. We were, um, I, I was in the truck, I shared this on a Wednesday a couple months ago, but I was in the truck with Emily one day, and we're driving down the road, and she she said, she said, Dad, she said, uh, who's in charge of the church? And I said, uh, I said, I said well, uh, God is. It's God's church. And she, she answered back. I get to see her in the little rearview mirror. And she goes, 
yeah, but, and uh, I could tell, she's like, yeah, I know that's true, but you know that's not the answer I'm looking for. Who's in charge of the church, you know? And I said, I said, well, God has, God has made some people pastors, and it's their job to oversee the church, and and that sort of thing. And I said, usually that's Papal, but he's sick right now, so we're kind of filling in. And uh, she answered me, and she goes, she goes, okay, that makes sense, because, like, I know God's in charge, but you can't really see him or anything, you know. <laughs> and I tell you, there's, there's a lot of truth in that little story. God has allowed pastors to have leadership in the church, but make no mistake about it, it is still God's church. He is the one that purchased it with his blood. And when a pastor leads a church, he doesn't do it as a lord over the church, but he does it as a steward under God. Christ, he purchased it with his own blood. And I tell you, the reason that Grace Baptist Church is here today is because over 2,000 years ago, Christ shed his blood on a cross. And if it wasn't for that, we would not be here. If it wasn't for that, we would have no hope. And the church is Christ's church. Without him willingly shedding his blood, we would have no hope this morning. And so tonight, what we're going to do is we are going to ask for God's face and God's will on what he would like done with his church. I, uh, I'll share the prayer I've been praying this week, and, and maybe as you pray this afternoon, you can pray it too. There's a, there's a story in Exodus with the Israelites. Do you remember when they, they had the golden calf that they made and started worshiping this thing and the the anger of God was kindled against them. And, and do you remember what God said to them after that? Moses was interceding for, between them and God, and, and God said this. God said, he said, I, I, I will let you go to the promised land, but I will not go with you. He said, I'm going to send an angel, and he'll go before you and fight for you, and you'll get to go to the promised land, but you're going to go to the promised land alone. I'm not going to be there with you. And do you remember what Moses responded with? Moses' prayer back to God was this. God if you will not go with us, I don't want to go. And that's been my prayer as we head into this weekend. God, I, I do not want to go forward with what we're about to do unless you're going to go with us. Uh, unless you're going to give your wisdom and your power and your, your hand of protection is going to be on it, I don't want to go forward. And I think that's what we should all pray. Would you bow your heads with me? We'll go to the Lord in prayer. And I, I want to ask you one simple question. And I told you I was going to ask it. But can I ask a favor of you this, this afternoon? Would you say, Brian, this afternoon I promise I will take five minutes to pray for our church. I will, I will find at least five minutes to sit down and seek God's face and ask that he gives clarity and direction and wisdom and his power going forward in this church. Uh, I'll commit to that. If that's you and you say, I, I will find five minutes to pray for our church this afternoon, would you just raise your hand? Say, I will find five minutes to seek the Lord's face on this this afternoon. Praise the Lord. Lord, we come to today, and we know we can't enter into this lightly. Lord, we can't assume that we know your will. We have to seek your face if we want to know your will. And Lord, we don't want to go forward unless you're going to be with us. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom. I pray that you would give us unity. I, I pray that, that the best days of this church would be before it, not behind it. And Lord, I thank you for how gracious you've been, and we look forward to what you're going to do in the future. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Would you stay with me, please? Turn to him. 494. Him 494 as we sing together. Him 494. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. appreciate you being with us and uh, let's pray this afternoon we'll have our meeting tonight and see what the lord would have us to do and excited about the future yes brother tom
you didn't hear that, he said 35 young men got saved on Tommy's football team this last weekend. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. He's a good God. He's still working. And uh, we thank him for that. Thank you for sharing, Tom. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Pastor Joey, would you mind closing us in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time, and just thank you that you uh, give us guidance.